Good morning, this is Earl Dietrich. I'll be starting the second webinar, which is readying uh, rigs for MPD installations. A brief background on me, um, 21, 22 years in underbalance drilling, managed pressure drilling. I've been at Weatherford about a year and a half as the Global Director of Deepwater Systems, primarily tasked with uh, making floating rigs uh, MPD ready so they're, they're quicker to respond to client requests to go to work, as well as looking at optimizations for jack-up rigs and platforms, as well as assisting with uh, critical wells, whether they're HPHT, pressurized mud cap, or a Uh, well problems with our clients. Uh, the first batch of slides is basically an overview. I'm not sure the, the depth of understanding of all the people on the call, so we have to start with a, a brief introduction and then it'll get more detailed as we carry on. Uh, managed pressure drilling definition, this is the short truncated version which came about as about six years of argument with the IADC committee trying to determine what managed pressure drilling is and how it's defined. Uh, the basics are we use surface back pressure, pump rate, and mud viscosity to control the equivalent circulating density in a well, any number of ways to try to allow the operators to get their wells to TD or alleviate well problems or enhance you know, the barriers in place for well control. So the, the definition doesn't say all that, but this definition was, was created by a committee of uh, 20 to 50 people that were changing constantly, so we were lucky to get a definition at all. Um, everybody on the call should understand that uh, the operator or client's requirements for what they need MPAD to do may be different from well to well. So uh, we just need to make sure that the systems are, are capable of doing what they're asking us to do. The, the visual that shows um, the uptake in MPD technology from 2003 to today shows a rapid uptake uh, beyond 2010. Um, in reality, it maybe hasn't been as steep as we had hoped, but we are seeing tremendous uptake in uh, making the rigs at least ready. Whether or not every rig is using the technology on every well, uh, we can't measure. We don't know exactly what all the competitors are doing at any given time or what the, what the complexity of the wells are, but certainly on the more complex wells, on the higher spec rigs, we're seeing a tremendous uptake and uh, much more interest from from operators, um, more questions from drilling contractors, and uh, even some some uptake and some questions from the shipyards themselves. I probably should stop. I failed to mention that all all questions that are entered will be held to the end. Uh, I will try to get through the slides in a timely manner, hopefully 35 to 40 minutes, and leave. 15 to 20 minutes at the end to answer questions. I could probably talk about this slide for 10 minutes, but this is the basis for all the technology we're using. From the far right-hand side of the screen, which is hydraulic fracturing of a weak reservoir, an under-pressured reservoir, um, an unconsolidated reservoir because the mud weights are too high, or because the equivalent circulating density due to the pump rate or viscosity is causing bottom hole pressure to be too high. Uh, these are things that we can easily overcome with, with some of these technologies. The majority of the wells that I've been involved with are in the sort of the hole ballooning, the yellow area to just to the left of the hydraulic fracturing, where for any number of reasons, either high temperature, high pressure wells, exploration, or a combination of both. Um, the wells 
do strange things with the pumps off. They flow when they shouldn't flow. Um, the, the mud changes density with depth and time. So controlling hole ballooning and, and verifying that the well is under control all the time is not as simple as doing a, a quick flow check you know, every hour. It, it requires a lot more technology. Stable well bore in the middle is what everybody uh, hopes to have, uh, unless the well is not complex or very shallow. This is unlikely to be the case. The splintering and the well bore collapse on the left-hand side of the shallow well bore. Uh, we've had some some clients come to us with wells where they're not maybe concerned about having a blowout. The wells don't behave in that way, but if if the, if the well pressure is cycled up and down during connections, during tripping, during uh, flat time well events. Sometimes they get they get breakout, they get collapsed, they get shearing and splintering, and they may lose the well bore or have to re-drill. So it may not always be a catastrophic event that we're trying to overcome. Obviously the far left is the catastrophic event, the well major kicker blowout. But we're trying to use a basket of, of equipment, a group of technologies to alleviate all these problems. We don't know necessarily when we install it what the problem the operator is going to have. You know, the drilling contractor may not know where the rig is going to go. The only person who really knows what the problem is is the operator. But the operator doesn't own drilling rigs. So this is where we are today is trying to figure out how to, to integrate into the rigs to you know, overcome the operator's well problems and make the rigs more marketable for the drilling contractors. As far as this bow tie diagram that you see, um, typical barriers, well, the typical barrier during every HAZOP, every discussion with regulators, every discussion with offshore class is, well, if any of those problems happen, we will close the BOP and go to well control. That barrier remains in place regardless of whether we're there or not providing an MPD service. What we're trying to do is enhance the, the detection of, of an influx, uh, minimize the time, or increase the granularity. So we see a smaller influx or we see the, the uh, fingerprint of an influx long before it's a major event or hazard. And we believe that putting you know, the, the early kick detection, the rotating control device, closing the well, enhancing the surveillance on the well by having all these extra people out there uh, adds a barrier, adds a prevention measure in this bow tie, so hopefully we can reduce the possibility of the major event in the middle. If you've seen any of our presentations recently, you've likely seen this slide. We talk about what's currently done. What's currently done is different components are supplied by different companies, either based on historical track record, equipment availability, price, um, company preference. And when you have a whole bunch of pieces of equipment on surface with independent control systems that don't talk to each other, uh, it requires a lot of people to run it. It requires redundant pressure and overpressure protection because the systems don't talk to each other. It requires uh, multiple instrumentation and control systems just, just to capture the data that you're getting. And it's, it's not optimized. It's, it certainly isn't where we'd like to be. We're trying to get to an MPD-ready system. The system would encompass multiple components that talk to each other, that hopefully uh, know the status of one another, that could reduce uh, the number of personnel required to continuously monitor and operate it. And eventually, you'd have a system where you, you have a fully ready system that you can call a system, not a group of components, that can do multiple things. So if the client, the end user, wants to use early kick detection, well, they have a system that can do that. They don't just have 
a Coriolis meter that can only do early kick detection. And we want the rig to be ready to do whatever the client asks. We don't want to try and build a system every time there's a different job. The system needs to be able to do multiple things, whether it's uh, managing gas cut mud, whether it's pressurized mud cap drilling, managed pressure drilling, early kick detection, high pressure, high temperature wells, enhanced flow monitoring. You know, these technologies, these words, they're not that different from each other. We use the same equipment, you use the same experts. You would likely go out and, and ask the same third parties for verification. So why have independent systems? We're trying to get a system that can do multiple things so that the, the rigs are better prepared to go to work, not just prepared to work for one operator or one region or one well type. Uh, they can meet more types of tender re requests. The types of rigs um, for the last year have been focused primarily on, on drill ships. There's a whole bunch of them without contracts. Uh, there's not that many tenders available, so trying to make them uh, competitive, trying to make them uh, ready to go to work faster uh, has been our focus. Historically, most of the revenue, most of the jobs are done on checkups. So we also need to figure out how to, how to make that better, how to make that quicker, how to make it cleaner and take up less tech space. In the future, uh, more than once, I've been on three different platforms where they know they're going to need it, some of these technologies on every single well because they've either had subsidence, they, they're trying to drill through a depleted reservoir to a lower seismic anomaly, they're trying to extend the reservoir, they're trying to add um, pressure, pressure maintenance by drilling into the reservoir. Whatever they're trying to do, they know that no matter where they drill off that platform, they're going to need some kind of uh, MPD technology. It makes sense to try and figure out how to how to optimize that so that it's it's quicker and easier to to install, particularly if you look at regions like Norway or the UK where we don't want to try and engineer to install it when it gets to the rig. It needs to all be pre-built, pre-engineered, pre-tested, pre-approved, so that it's very quick to install when you get offshore because there's a lot of layers of of regulation and inspection in order to get it approved for use. And we don't need to be taking up a whole bunch of time, um, shutting down production on platforms, making operators angry. You know, the whole point is to to put more tools at their disposal and do it quicker. And that's what we're trying to do is trying to have concepts available for platform TLPs, drill ship semis, and, and obviously for class rigs as well. The historical setup that, that is done on jackup rigs has a MPD manifold, which at Weatherford is called a microflux manifold, a rotating control device, some valves, some hoses, hydraulic power unit. Uh, what you can't see is there's some, some instrumentation, some uh, HMI panels up on the rig floor where the operators run the equipment from, and this group of equipment allows us to close the hole with the rotating control device and add surface back pressure with the microflux manifold and measure the flow going out with the Coriolis meter. Uh, in addition, there's a, the stroke counters on the front end measuring what the pumps are putting into the hole. So the flow in, the flow out, the closed hole, and the surface back pressure gives us enough control over the well that we can meet a lot of well objectives, whether they're extending casing points, um, dealing with salt, dealing with troublesome breathing formations, high pressure, high temperature, Wh whatever supposedly unique well problems they have in that field are not all that unique. You know, the, the equipment doesn't change from job to job. How it's rigged up changes a little bit, um, and that's 
part of what we're trying to fix as well is the standardization of what's used, how it's used, how it's rigged up. Because when it comes to class rigs, which I'll talk about later, it needs to be standardized. We don't want to have to go back and explain every single time why it's different. Why are we doing it different? Why do we believe that this is unique? Because to the class societies, it doesn't need to be unique. It just needs to be safe. For the floating rig installations that I've been looking at recently, when you look at components, there's a lot of components required to, to put all this together and make it work. Uh, how much space they take up, how, they, how, how much they weigh, uh, how, how you can maybe stack them, do they need to be in or out of their crash frames, do the crash frames need to be D and V, you know, do you need redundancy, what kind of oil do they use, what kind of spill protection is there, these are early questions. But the hard part is actually the interfacing of these pieces of equipment. So there's a ton of air interfaces with the rig. We're taking air from the rig to run and deploy reelers. Uh, we use it for uh, backups on, on the pressure control valve units that control, or that protect, I guess, the system from overpressure. In addition to that, there are hydraulic connections that are surface and subsea, so we have uh, surface stab plates, multi-stabs, uh, permanent tubing, some temporary hoses, and then full subsea umbilicals with subsea stab plates. All of this is not a rental item, it's a bunch of pieces that are required to assemble a system. As well, on the surface, all these pieces of equipment require power. Uh, the power requirements are different. The rig may be ATEX, it may be IECEX, it may be operating in different areas. There may be different EX explosion guidelines that we have to to abide by. And we don't want to change our equipment every time. We want to change, make sure we understand the interfaces so that when we install it, uh, there's no issues either at the installation and commissioning phase or the systems integration test phase. It just plugs in and works as planned. In addition to the hydraulic and power, there's a, there's a bunch of fiber data and other connections where we're monitoring the system, we're controlling the system, we're operating the system, and all these interfaces are um, not unique on every rig, but it's a little bit unique. Each each rig has a slightly different idea of how they would like it installed. As long as the philosophy doesn't change from installation to installation, it, it's uh, not that difficult to go back to a class society and say, well, we made this small change, we made it because it's an improvement or it was necessary because of our client, and here's the impact on the system. So as long as we have a reason, it's okay to have changes, but to change it just because um, the client would like it to look a little bit different, um, you know, isn't going to necessarily happen. You know, some of these things can't be changed. Some of the interfaces must stay the same. Um, sometimes we may have to make modifications to the rig, whether it's power, um, deck strengthening, uh, building building decks so you can stack things. These are not necessarily uh, necessary on every rig, but because the deck space, the deck loading, um, and on semis, the variable deck load are really important, you know, we need to have enough concepts available so we can do this uh, quickly and easily and not have to re-engineer it every single time we install the system. The layouts that I'm going to briefly show you are the same ones I showed at IEDC in Rome in June. But we do conceptual layouts for temporary installations weekly. So clients have a well or they have a problem. They want to know if it will fit, how we can do it, how much does it weigh. Uh, quickly, the, the rigs are surveyed. 
and everything is measured, as much information is gathered as possible, and we have a team who does uh, conceptual layouts for temporary installations. This is a flat layout that takes uh, up some real estate on the BOP trolley. The next one is a stacked layout for a semi-submersible where uh, we didn't want to take up room on the BOP trolley. We're trying to minimize the deck space and use an area that had the capacity for higher variable deck load to stack our equipment and keep it out of the way. Uh, the third layout is kind of a hybrid. It's using the BOP trolley and we're stacking up on the deck. And part of the reason this is necessary is that this concept was done for a, a double block and bleed type choke manifold and that is a little bit heavier and you know we didn't want to take up all the deck space we would prefer to use only what's necessary on the main deck and they didn't foresee needing uh, the BOP trolley uh, during the MPD hole sections. There was quite a fancy video here I was going to show you but uh, due to its size I will briefly talk through uh, some of the rig integration pieces that we look at on a weekly basis. We're trying to, I'm trying to, um, create enough concepts so that if an operator comes and says we have a well problem, or if a drilling contractor comes and says we want to respond to a tender, we can tell them exactly what they need, how long it's going to take, approximately how much it will cost based on um, the area they're trying to operate, the regulations, the class of the rig, what's known about the operator's wells, and the availability of current equipment. So instead of shutting down rigs, instead of pulling them into shipyards for months and months, right now there's an awful lot of them shut down. So if we have the concept available and a contract is awarded, we're trying to minimize the time to respond uh, so that rig can mobilize sooner and go to work sooner. 101% of the, the work that's been done so far is retrofit. Um, every single job has been a retrofit on an existing rig. In parallel, we do talk with, uh, with companies that engineer rigs, companies that manufacture rigs, uh, like the shipyards. Um, as well as drilling contractors who are either in the process of building new rigs or thinking about building new rigs, how we can integrate some of this equipment in in a new build. So uh, minimize the crash frames, minimize the deck space, you know, a more harmonized approach with the, with the rig either while it's in the shipyard or immediately after. Uh, the retrofits that have been done have historically been flat. We haven't spent a lot of time building structures because we're not structural engineers. We're managed pressure drilling service providers. But there is opportunity to stack equipment, build frames, strengthen decks to minimize the deck space. And each project we look at now, we are trying to go more vertical than horizontal so that we're not uh, taking up all available deck space in the Christmas tree area or on the main deck so that um, so the equipment is more hidden, more out of the way, and it's not constantly in conflict with the other rig activities when, when MPD is not in use. You know, they don't rig up and rig down cement units or wireline units or other pieces of equipment. Uh, when they're not in use, they're just out of sight, out of mind. And that's what we would prefer this is, is available when needed and when it's not needed we don't want it in the way we don't want it taking up valuable deck space we would just like it to be uh, hidden properly integrated so that it's not coming and going being shipped back and forth and requiring crash frames and, and lifting equipment and shift you know we would prefer to just have it on the rig leave it on the rig service it on the rig and in the case of class rigs certify it with the rig. Uh, the upper right retrofit picture shows the original 
uh, MPD stack that was deployed in Asia Pacific uh, until it was actually fully in service until recently, at which point we have disassembled some of it and used the, the components to build an integrated stack like is seen below. The primary difference is maybe not obvious, but there's some choke, kill, boost, and uh, mux and auxiliary lines that are wrapped around um, the MPD, MPD joint that's shown on the bottom of the screen. Uh, the majority of those components are spacers. There's an awful lot of uh, real estate you see there that's required to space things out properly and bend those lines so they can be wrapped around the equipment. Uh, regardless whether it's the upper or the lower, uh, the systems are, are meant to go below the tension ring and try not to be interfering with the, the rig's tensioners and the existing equipment on the rig. Everything's supposed to be below the water and out of the way. Uh, for new builds, we have concepts where we're trying to integrate reelers, we're trying to uh, actuate more valves, trying to uh, fix what a manifold looks like so they can do all of those things that are described earlier, whether they're kick detection, pressurized mud cap, uh, managed pressure drilling, riser gas management. To me, to Weatherford, it's not necessary to have five different manifolds. You know, we're trying to find a way to use the iron that's, that's there for more than one purpose. So as long as it can meet the, the API requirements, the class requirements to perform that operation, it doesn't necessarily need to be redundant. It just needs to be safe. It needs to not have any single point failures in it. I only briefly talked uh, about standardization, but uh, I spent a decade uh, making my living going from rig to rig, uh, implementing these projects, looking at the uniqueness of the well, the uniqueness of the rig, and trying to work with service companies on a on adequate solution. Well, now, at a service company, we own a lot of assets, we own a lot of equipment, and it's difficult to have five different kinds of equipment based on five different kinds of jobs that might be performed. The equipment needs to be standardized to the point where it can be used on any kind of job. It needs to be deployable worldwide. It needs to meet the same safety requirements. It needs to be rigged up in the same way. It needs to fail in the same way so that we can have standardized procedures, standardized failure modes, and test the system in the same way so that when there's when there's an issue, you know, it's easy to correct across all systems instead of having multiple different systems depending on whether it's the Gulf of Mexico or South America or the North Sea or Norway or different operator requirements. Those requirements don't don't help us, you know, correct problems. Each of those individual requirements, each of those individual bespoke changes are a system that uh, is different than the others. And when it's different than the others, it's difficult to fix, it's difficult to learn, and it's difficult to improve. I probably missed this slide by talking about the last slide, but again, you know, when every rig up is different, when every system is different, when the interfaces are different, then all the procedures need to be different whether they're the regular operating procedures or the emergency procedures. If, for example, one company had 15 rigs, you know, it would make sense to standardize the, the PNID the system and the interfaces so that each of those rigs was exactly the same. Then they could have the same procedures, the same failure modes, the same HAZOPs, the same risk mitigation, and people could go from rig to rig and understand how the system works. Instead of having 15 different systems that work in 15 different ways, that all have different procedures. So to me, it's important to get them standardized so that when I talk to 
an operator, a drilling contractor, even a Weatherford region, I understand exactly what they have and what they're using it for. Because right now, it depends on the client. It does. It depends on the client and the rig. And every P&ID may be slightly different than the last one. And it's very difficult to go to offshore class or to a regulator and explain this if there's no compelling reason to have it changed. They need to be standard. They need to operate the same way, fail the same way, so that we can uh, mitigate the risks in the same way and demonstrate that they're safe. For, for well rentals, in the projects that I've historically been involved with, it's taken anywhere from 6 to 12 months to prepare uh, rigs for for a well or for multiple wells. So to do temporary or semi-permanent or permanent pipework installations, do all the rig interfacing, the EX registers, the fire and gas, uh, equipment layouts, rig training, familiarization, testing of equipment. This has taken 6 to 12 months. Regardless of whether it's been a, a jack-up or a platform, I haven't been involved with a TLP, but I assume it's very similar. On a floater, the lead times are even worse, and the reason being that that more than more likely than not, these new floaters are uh, carry some sort of offshore class, whether it's ABS, CDS, OSE 101 or whatever Lloyd's is going to come up with in the next six months. So these class requirements uh, sometimes make it so we can't use the existing equipment. We may need to build brand new equipment to meet a contract, or we may need to test it or verify it in a different way. The rigs have class when they leave the shipyard. That may sound a little funny, but they they procure the rig in such a way that it's surveyed, inspected, engineered, and verified at a very high level. Um, once it leaves the shipyard, whether that class is maintained or not, hard to say. Some do and some don't. We have to assume that they want to maintain class and that all the equipment we build and install, whether temporary, permanently, uh, has to meet the same standards. And that's not just about having good equipment that we pressure test regularly is having fully documented equipment. You know where it came from. You have all the quality uh, that goes along with the build, the testing, the engineering, and the verification, all the factory acceptance testing, everything that's required to demonstrate that the equipment's safe, well engineered, and fit for purpose. Honestly, whether that's a jack-up or a floater, doesn't matter if the rig carries class, it all has to be done. But on a floater, it's it's more difficult to to get the equipment spotted. It's more difficult to route the piping. And with the day rates that they command, uh, there's a lot of hesitation to take them out of service to get all this done. So there is some there have been some installations done in situ, you know. Uh, where you spend six months installing pipework uh, one at a time, testing them one at a time because the rigs don't want to be taken out of service. Now there's a ton of rigs out of service. So it's trying to figure out exactly what needs to be done, how long it's going to take, and tighten up these lead times for uh, rigs that are currently parked or uncontracted or that will be doing five-year SPS. For the rig types, uh, the jackups, historically and probably for the foreseeable future, they'll be 100% rental. So it's called out like any other service. We would like to drill. We would like you to come out and perform a service so the regions can handle that all by themselves. It's in response to one or more well problems, and the operator is the client. So they decide they need it based on whatever the well is telling them or whatever the offset well has told them. Platform and TLPs have 
lots of wells underneath. They all have the same problems. They determine they need it for one well. They likely need it for most wells. And it would make more sense to at least contemplate a permanent installation and sale because it's not a doesn't make any sense to send it back and forth. If, if no matter whether you're going to do a workover, re-entry, re-drill, or drill to a deeper horizon, if you're always going to need this equipment, it should be part of the rig. So the semis and drill ships, historically it's been, oh, we have a well problem, can you rent us equipment? But m more frequently now, we're talking about uh, an unknown well problem. The rig has has a life of 30 plus years. How do we make this rig as capable as possible so it can respond to the most kind of well types? To do that, they're going to have to buy some equipment. They're going to have to buy rig-specific crossovers, handling equipment, all the things that are required to interface with that rig specifically. Anything to do with uh, crossovers has a very long lead time. And we're trying to minimize the installation time on these rigs because the day rate's very high. Everybody would be, well, the drilling contractors would, would much prefer the rig is out on rental. And so would I. You know, I would prefer that the rig is not sitting in a shipyard getting worked on. I'd prefer it's out making money. The only thing that, that that makes it even harder at times is if the rig carries class. And that's not to sound negative. There's good things that come with rig class. But quite likely, even more equipment will need to be purchased and, and permanently installed. Some of it needs dedicated serial numbers, either dedicated to the rig or maybe shared between rigs. If you went all the way and fully survey brand new equipment, it's possible to get something called a product certificate from DNV, where it could go to any DNV rig without being re-looked at. But again, these things require new build, brand new equipment. And being that Weatherford's in the rental equipment business, uh, that's not always going to be possible. We're going to try to rent where possible. But if the client demands that it meets a DNV requirement or if the rig carries DNV class, then we're going to have to either sell them equipment or figure out a way to split the capital sale and rental so that the rig has everything it needs to be approved with a minimal um, outlay of funds. I've mentioned class a little bit, but not regulatory as much. Um, as far as regulatory considerations, regardless of where the rig is going, we have to be aware of the the local requirements. So whether it's a, the Gulf of Mexico, BSEE, uh, NORSOC, Brazil, PSA, they all have different requirements and we want to make sure that whatever we're supplying um, is safe and can be approved by that regulator. The operator has their own requirements, which are normally linked to well problems and or well problems and uh, improved HSME. The drilling contractor has an asset, a rig, that we're trying to interface with. So they would like minimum disruption, they would like minimum cutting and welding, they would like minimum changes to the rig because it changes how it operates, it requires retraining, and it requires offshore class to come out and look at it. We're right in the middle. We're trying to supply equipment to the operator or the drilling contractor that meets everybody's requirements. So we're not special. We're no different than the competitor. They all do the same thing. But I'm trying, we are trying to get our head around what these interfaces are. For example, the major interface between the operator and the regulator is getting the well permitted. Part of getting the well permitted in the Gulf of Mexico is demonstrating that the technology or the extension of technology is safe and reliable. That's us, okay? That's what we have to prove. 
between the regulator and the drilling contractor. They want to know how's the drilling contractor going to take care of well control, what's the safety case for the rig, uh, the new SEMS requirements, uh, tell us about training, and if we're going to in install new equipment that has different functionality or increased functionality, uh, how does that impact the drilling contractor? So they're going to need our assistance to get to keep everything uh, in compliance. Between the operator and the drilling contractor, it's very similar, except in the Gulf of Mexico, they need the deep water operations plan. That also requires talking about extensions of technology. Uh, what are you going to use? What's the best available, safest technology? And as a company, as a product line, we're supplying systems that, that interface with all of these. It's different than supplying a liner hanger or, or a tubing running service where it has a discrete purpose. We're supplying a service that enhances uh, kick detection, potentially improves well control, and deals with well problems. And it's right in the middle between the regulator, the operator, and the drilling contractor. So we need to have a very safe, reliable system that we can demonstrate. That was the regulatory part. Uh, the second part is the offshore class. And regardless of how we lay out graphics, the process is the same. We're trying to get either a permanent or a temporary installation approved on either a retrofit or a new build. So they have a rig that's already approved or we wouldn't be bothering. We have to explain the changes we're going to make why we're making them, if it's an improvement, uh, how it improves things, what we know about it, how it's engineered, etc. That's part of the initial request. To get approved, uh, we have to do the engineering design reviews. So uh, with ABS, that's the independent reviews. With DNV, it's the DVR, the design verification reports, where they're checking the materials the quality, the manufacturing of the components used to assemble the systems. Uh, beyond the components and the subsystems, there sometimes is a requirement to show FAT, factory acceptance testing, SIT, systems integration testing, uh, do the safety engineering, so HAZOP, HAZID, Tomika and close out all the action items. They're not going to approve a system that has 50 action items pending closure. We're asking them to approve a retrofit on a rig. The rig's already approved. So in order to keep the rig approved, we need to demonstrate that it's at least as safe or safer than it was before. During the, the build, in parallel to this engineering review, there's a survey going on where they're surveying either the build if it's new equipment or the SIT track if it's existing equipment. Finally, ending up with on the rig survey uh, at installation and commissioning to verify that it, it does what we say it would do. It shuts down the way we said it would shut down. The pressure protection works as described. Everything is as described. They're there to verify. I can have a quick drink of water. I think I might even be on time. In summary, the, the process that we're working through currently historically has been about the well. Now I'm trying to focus more on the rig. So what kind of rig is it? Um, where is it working? So figure out what the rig is and perform a full survey with or without um, laser scanning or, or additional um, you know, fancier survey types. We need to get gather all the information about the rig. Once we survey it, we're trying to understand what the class issues are and the regulatory issues. So where is it operating? and what additional verification is required for us to interface with it, install new equipment,
change equipment, cut into the rig, penetrate the deck, etc. What does the operator need to do? So they, they either have a rig or they're renting a rig. Um, they have their own policies on what they can and can't do with equipment. The well is posing some challenges we need to understand. They hopefully have historical or offset data. What is the drilling plan? Do they need all this technology? They only need part of it? Uh, are they complex wells, HPHT, exploration? What, what are they asking for? What do they need this for? And then trying to get the, the roles and responsibilities sorted out. So who's responsible, accountable, who needs to be informed about these different things. So who's managing the integration? The contractor, the operator, the shipyard, Weatherford? It's unlikely to be any one company. It's going to be a bunch. So who's doing what and who's responsible for what? Whether it's going to be a temporary, a semi-permanent, or a permanent installation, which obviously probably depends on the rig type and the type of well problems they have. Ordering the long lead items specifically for floating rigs, so crossovers and interfaces and handling equipment. We're talking about crossovers that can take in excess of 3.5 million pounds of tensile. They have to go underwater. They have to interface with a rig riser system. You have to be able to run and deploy a BOP with it installed. These are not trivial matters, so the items are long lead. They're expensive. They have to be engineered. And uh, unfortunately, they're unique to the rig because very few rigs have common risers. They may sound the same, but the, the orientation of the external lines is almost always different from rig to rig. And finally, once we've worked through all these things, what does the factory acceptance test of the components look like? How do we do systems integration tests of the subsystem? What's the purpose of all this pressure protection? How does it work? What's the redundancy? How do we test it and validate it to show that it does what it's supposed to do? How do we make all these computers work together? And how do we share data so that we don't have to have two or three monitors clogging up uh, the driller's shack? And how does all this newly installed equipment interface with the fire and gas, uh, the EX register, as well as just general search and rescue on the rig? So while it may be simple to say we need it for a well, it's not simple to install it. There's a lot of things we have to work through to get to an MPD ready or semi-ready uh, rig that can be deployed. No time for questions. So you want me to keep talking? <laughs> uh, apparently, there's a small technical difficulty, and I'm not going to be able to take questions at this time, but uh, we will address all questions afterwards. Uh, it lets me off the hook a little bit easy because my throat is dry, but the, the MPD answers email that's on the screen, um, whether your question is ranked one or a million, um, this will actually get you a response to all questions. We will go through them. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the technology is letting us down this morning, and we can't, uh, can't even see the questions on the screen at this time. There will be two further uh, webinars coming up. Fortunately, you won't have to hear me speak at either of them. Uh, you will have a much more polished and uh, professional presenter. But they will be talking about uh, deployments on land, so what, what we're doing or planning to do for uh, safer uh, implementation for, for land rigs, uh, smaller equipment, smaller footprint. Uh, while using a lot of the technology that we're developing for deep water. So, you know, leveraging all the things that we're doing for deep water rigs without necessarily all the equipment uh, and redundancy, just the technology shifted to land. And finally, the last uh, 
last webcast in November, the drill, new drilling convention will hopefully be a polished version of the three prior webcasts. So the high points, you know, what are the key the key technologies? Why? Who needs this and why? Um, who's the who's the customer? Is the customer the operator, the drilling contractor, or the shipyard? Probably all three. But uh, you know, we believe as a company that, that, that the technologies uh, do significantly improve uh, safety operability on on complex wells, and feel that it's a, a tremendous improvement. Hence the, the new drilling convention. And I guess, since I can't take any questions, I'm going to wrap up a few minutes early and go back to my real job. I appreciate you all uh, joining me and listening to me. And uh, I, I look forward to, to reading your questions and responding to them over the next week to 10 days. <laughs>